Anthony. Originally, this talk was intended to be devoted entirely to Zemlinsky's string quartets, latching into the se sequence of concerts by the Brodsky Quartet with the Hampstead Arts Festival, two of which have already taken place, and the other two taking place next week with the third and fourth quartets. Then we thought, well, maybe I'll be preaching entirely to the converted this evening, but the likelihood is that people would pr prefer a degree of further background information about Zemlinsky himself, who he was, what he, where he came from, what he stood for, and so the title became Zemlinsky and his Quartets. And now after further consideration, it's now Zemlinsky, open brackets, and his Quartets, dot, 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 close brackets. So a good deal of Zemlinsky. Zemlinsky, of course, and Austria in particular, and Vienna, because that's why we're here tonight, Austrian Cultural Forum. Like most Viennese of his generation, his parents came from somewhere else entirely. His father and his family were born and brought up in what is now Slovakia, was then part of Hungary, in a small town now called Kisutski Nove Metzko, uh, Neustadt, uh, very close to what is now Zilina, was in those days Scholna, Hungarian, or Silein an der Zips, if we want to mention it in German. They were Catholics. His family mostly were railway officials. His grandfather came to Vienna and worked for the, Neu, the new uh, Schönbrunn railway line, and then became uh, self-employed and sold cigarettes and tobacco in the second Bezirk, in the Leopoldstadt, where almost all the emigrants from Eastern Europe, whether north or south, came when they settled when they came to Vienna. His, um, his mother was the daughter of a wandering Sephardic scholar. His name, Shemtov Semo. Shemtov Semo seems to have spent most of his life in Sarajevo, but he came to Vienna in the late 1860s to found a, a, a new periodical for the Sephardic Jewish world. Um, we were just called El Correo de Vienna, the, uh, the, the, the Viennese magazine. I've never been able to read it, unfortunately, because Sephardics, they, they would write in Ladino, their own special Judeo-Hebraic language, using Hebrew characters. That's too much for me, and unfortunately my attempts to find people in Vienna to decipher these writings for me have been unsuccessful. His daughter, Clara, met Zemlinsky's father, Adolf, somewhere within the rounds of the, the Leopoldstadt, of the, the second precinct, where, as I say, most emigres settled when they came. It had the benefit of being very close to the center of Vienna, and accommodation was not expensive, very much the equivalent of Whitechapel in London. And, of course, no closed ghetto, but an open ghetto. Those who made, made progress with their life in Vienna Took, took it upon themselves to leave the ghetto as soon as possible. The older generation of Jewish emigres, like the Tudescos, had already built their palaces in the middle of the city. Those who had meanwhile come to wealth and, and happiness, like the Hofmann star family, lived out in the, in, in the greener areas outside Vienna, uh, sometimes also in very palatial accommodation. So it was, it was rather like emigrating to, to, to New York at the turn of the century. It was every man's challenge to make his way. But there was a lot of poverty in that area as well, a lot of squalor. And during the course of Zemlinsky's younger life, a de growing degree of anti-Semitism amongst the Viennese people. Not surprising when one considers what an influx there was in such a short time, that the city had been open to the Jews in the middle of the 19th century. The university was open to Jewish students in the 1890s, but within a few years, about two-thirds of the students were Jewish. The Jews took over more or less the medical profession, the legal profession, the banking, which they'd already been busy with since the Middle Ages in Vienna. 
and the music of the musical world to a large extent as well. Um, it's not surprising that some people took this as an un undesirable situation and, and reacted, shall we say, overreacted. That whole generation brought, grew up with the growing tension of, of anti-Semitism in the city. It's behind much of Zemlinsky's life, which is why one needs to mention it again here. Now, Adolf Zemlinsky was an insurance salesman, and he met Clara Seymour. I don't know how, we don't really know. And they married in 1869, I believe, 1869. But there was a Jewish marriage, and Adolf von Zemlinsky, as he called himself, converted from Catholicism to Judaism to, to marry Clara Seymour. Not only that, uh, became a, an expert in the Sephardic Jewish religion, was, was a, appointed secretary to the Sephardic community, which he remained until his early death at uh, the age of 55 in 1900. Adolf was a writer, um, he wrote a good deal for a very much Jewish orientated magazine, a witty, witty uh, magazine called Wiener Punch, very much like the, the uh, English punch of the same period, with lots of pictorial cartoons, but also wittier and lighter um, reviews, but some serialized novels. Zemlinsky himself wrote several such novels, which were all serialized in magazines such as the uh, Österreich Ungarische Kantorenzeitschrift. There's, uh, there's such a thing that really existed. There was a special monthly periodical for all the musicians in the German speaking world. Anyway, this goes in strong contrast with what I was told when I first met Zemlinsky's second wife, Louise in the 1980s in her old people's home in the Riverside area of New York. Before even letting me into her apartment, she said to me on the threshold, my, my husband was not Jewish, she said. My husband was not Jewish. Okay, well, her father had married a Muslim in Sarajevo, so on the mother's side, Zemlinsky was half Sephardic Jewish and half Muslim. On the other side, he was 50% Catholic. And these were things that didn't concern him in the least. When he was a young man, he was certainly not a religious person. We do know, though, because of his father's activity as secretary to the Sephardic community, that he, would, that he played the organ for special holiday festivities. For instance, because of their indebtedness to the Sultan of Turkey, they always celebrated the Sultan's birthday in the Sephardic synagogue. But we know from documentation that Zemlinsky played the organ on one, at least one occasion for such an event. By the turn of the century and the rise of anti-Semitism, his, his brother-in-law, Arnold Schoenberg, whom I will come to return to in a minute, um, was the first to leave the Jewish faith. Zemlinsky followed suit in the early 20th century, became a Lutheran rather than a Catholic. But it was really only a question of of leaving, he actually managed to move from the second Bezirk to the third, and from there to the area near the Fox Oper, the Liechtensteinstraße, where he and Schoenberg lived next to each other during the, uh, the years preceding World War I. He was not a religious person, as I say, but it was a, became of radical importance much, much later in his life to prove where he was. When the, the Nazis moved, in, moved into Austria in March 1938. His first reaction was, I will stay, they will do nothing to me. And his wife, Louise, who was 100% Jewish, said, I have to go. And there were some days of heart-rending discussion, and he went round to collect his father's birth certificate, which was from a, a Catholic church in the Second, Amazon, second Bezirk, all the other papers until the crunch came when he had to produce evidence of his parents' marriage. And the marriage certificate was in the Jewish archives. And it was only then, apparently, that he realized that he himself was Jewish and would have to go.
But that's right, the other, the other end of his life. His life falls into five irregular periods. There's a long period of, in Vienna when he began to study. He started playing the piano at the age of six. He was found to be highly talented, moved on to um, school, left school early at the age of 14, and was then taken on to the uh, conservatorium, where he enjoyed perhaps one of the most expansive edu musical educations uh, of anybody of that generation. Most of them picked up by, by seeing and doing, learning and doing, learning by doing, but he was really given a very thorough schooling, which showed, I think, in the handwork of his, of his compositions throughout his life, the first period in Vienna continued reaching its summit much too soon in his life. At the age of 29, his second opera, Es war einmal, was, was conducted by Mahler at the Hof Oper. It was a huge, well, it was a, a good success. I can't say it was a huge success, uh, but it was a good success. And a few days later, he himself conducted a big choral, choral work at the, in the, in the Golden Saal of, of the um, Musikverein, 300 singers and the Vienna Philharmonic. When he was only 29, where, so where could he go from here? Well, as often happens in such circumstances, his career began to wane. And by the time he had composed his fourth opera, as uh, Kleider machen Leute, his fate was somehow sealed in Vienna. They, the, the general tenor of, of uh, argument was he has little, little to offer us. And so he took an offer to move to Prague. And he became chief conductor of the German theater in Prague in 1911, remained there till 1927. Then, at an invitation from Otto Klemperer, he, he moved to Berlin, uh, where he was second conductor, second to Klemperer, that is, at the, the, the newly found Kroll Oper, famous for its uh, adventurous and modern productions. He stayed there as long as he could. The crawl was closed in 1932, but by then he had begun to conduct as a guest all over Eastern Europe and in Russia. Uh, he left Germany as he had to in 1933, resettled in Vienna. Meanwhile, he had married for the second time. His second wife came from a well-to-do family. She built a beautiful house in Grinzing, which still stands. And they lived there in some degree of luxury from 1935 until 1938. Then it was a question of packing the cases and going. He and his wife fled via Prague and Rotterdam to the, to the New World, where they arrived just after Christmas 1938. Soon after arriving, a half a year after arriving, Zemlinski suffered a, a severe stroke uh, from which he'd never quite recovered, had several further strokes, and finally died in February 1942 outside New York in, in a small, smaller um, suburban area. So that's the outline of his life. Interesting, the number five, the five periods of his life. His music is infected, invested, shall we say, with numer numerological studies. It wouldn't have disturbed me if it hadn't been such an obvious thing. He was born on the, the 14th of October, 1871. And for a long time, he kept that date. Then towards the end of the 1890s, he suddenly started telling everybody he'd been born on the 4th of October, 1872. There is no earthly reason why, she, why he should have done that. He, he didn't need to make himself older than he already was. It was a puzzle for a long time why he did this. Well, many, many of the reference works published up to the end of the last century give the wrong date. In fact, even his tombstone in the Zentralfriedhof in Vienna contained the wrong date for some years until somebody pointed it out and the plate was taken away and scratched out and, and redone. What strikes me, strikes one about these two dates, it's a sort of what they call a, an amateur's Kabbalah. It was a habit amongst people in those days to, to count up letters and numbers and add them together. You may know that in the real Kabbalah, uh, scholars would 
would, would work for years to count. It's called Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alpha, alphabet one, and Beth two, and so on. And by transliterating each word of the the Talmud or the Old Testament in, into numbers, they would count them up in the hope of one day finding the divine number, the number of God himself. Uh, amateurs would not do that, but they would maybe count up the letters of their name, or they, uh, one avoided a name with 13 letters in it, for instance. In this case, if you count up the numbers as they come, you get 1 plus 4, 5, 6, 7, 15... 22, 23. I don't need to insult your intelligence by pointing out that the, the, the sum of the numbers of the other date is the same. So we have 23, and the sum of 2 plus 3, of course, is 5. So we have this strange kind of equation, 2 plus 2 plus 3, if you wish, equals 5. And the strange thing is that you find this everywhere in Zeminsky's music. For instance, the opening of the second string quartet. I'm only talking about the first three notes. You can look at them both ways. If you take the scale of C major, we're talking about uh, steps number two and number three and number five. If you take, if you count the semitones, you've got two semitones, you've got three semitones, and all, all, all together they make five semitones. You know, there are only these steps of the scale on which this particular combination of numbers can, can be said to arrive. For this reason, you'll find this, maybe for this reason, we don't know, it becomes a central subject in Zemlinsky's music. I would say it was his ego in music. But then there's another same series of, of, of notes, which is the inversion of the ego. One could say this represents the world. The ego is the one theme, the world is the other. And often enough in his compositions there's a dialogue. Sometimes the world is at harmony with the ego, sometimes they're in conflict with one another. Uh, sometimes one follows after the other. Sometimes he extends the 2 plus 3 equals 5, to add other numbers, further numbers in front of it. On one particular occasion, this is very interesting, in the second string quartet, he, he makes his sister's name, Matilda, out of these notes. We hear these pitches. And if I put the, the, the second and third, the third and fourth pitches up one octave... Zemlinsky's ego plus one extra note. Now, if I transpose that down a fourth, I get A, H, now this be natural, D, and E. And those are the only four musical letters of the name Matilda. And you'll find these same letters in Berg's chamber concerto, where he again refers. To, to Matilda. Now, I'm jumping backwards and forwards. Let's go back to Zemlinsky's family briefly. He was the eldest son. A second child died in uh, with the age of six weeks. His sister Matilda was two years younger. They grew up in harmony, in poverty, and uh, were very close, very close. Zemlinsky became conductor of an amateur orchestra in Vienna, the Polyhymnia, in 1894 uh, or thereabouts, and very soon after its founding, a young bank clerk turned up to play the cello, scratching away at Zeminski, later remembered him, whose name was Arnold Schoenberg. And uh, they become very, became very close friends. Everything that Zeminski had learned at great, in great detail at the conservatorium, he seems to have passed on quite selflessly to Schoenberg, 
who never had any formal tuition as a musician at all. After a while, about 1899, Schoenberg moved into the Zemlinski home in the Weissenbergstraße, third Bezirk, and evidently was having uh, an affair with Matilda, which grew into a, a proper declaration of love, represented musically by Schoenberg's Verklärte Nacht, and they married in 1901. Schoenberg and Matilda had to move away to Berlin because he needed a permanent job. He found an offer in, in Berlin, and they moved out of Zemlinski's life for a while until, until they returned two years later. It was a very close relationship, and like such things, over the years it became stormy at times, smoothed down again, until it broke down completely after the establishing of the 12-note technique of Schoenberg's in 1921, 1922, 1923. This was for the reasons that I've more or less touched on already. In the tonal system, as he saw it, these numbers I mentioned, Zemlinsky, like many of his contemporaries, saw the divine, the divine presence was, was, was to be seen through the numbers, through the balance of the numbers, the keys. When man began to determine the numbers himself by a system of, of arithmetic manipulation, they were, shall we say, going against the divine properties of music as, as, we, as we know it in the Western world. I think this was the main reason why they fell out. They, I mean, I don't think Schoenberg was a very easy person to get on with most of the time anyway. And, and uh, there were many cases where they argued, fell apart, came together again. But this was the final break. There was only a reconciliation of a kind when they were both landed up in America. Uh, but by that time, Schoenberg was living in California. Zemlinski had hoped to move to California, but was too, too ill to leave New York. So there was only contact by post, but nevertheless, it was, again, friendly and uh, reconciliating. So that's one aspect of Zemlinski, these numbers. There's much more to it than that. But the, the extraordinary thing is how he sticks, sticks to them throughout his his compositions, you will find this D-E-G group of notes in all of his string quartets or in various other versions. For instance, the very beginning of the first string quartet, written in 1898, A major, and if you take, ignore the first note, Sounds like this, quite simply. And at the same time, we have its inversion. Now, if you put them together, as Brahms liked to do, he would always say, take the melody and the bass line and leave everything out. If it sounds convincing, it's good. If it's not so convincing, it's bad. You get a very unpromising sequence of notes. into some recognizable form. Etc. He does the same thing later in his symphonic poem, The Mermaid, which is the first big work composed after the death of Brahms in 1902, and here he simplifies the idea of simply to two notes. And I said, I beg your pardon. That's, we have an octave, no problem, and then this unpleasant sounding ninth. Now he's written a song called, uh, a setting of um, Jens Peter Jakobsen called Turmwächterlied. 
which begins with that combination. When he came to write his Eofrau, four years later, he took the same idea, but it became a little richer. And he called that the, the, the theme of man's eternal soul. Now, it is also, this itself is full of numerological, musical surprises. If I take all these notes and the others in the middle as well, you get this as well, and all those pitches come into it. If I iron them out and play them one after another, the number five becomes important again. I have five fifths. turn that upside down, I, I get this, which we know fairly well, I think, is the main subject of Schoenberg's chamber symphony. So the, there was an amazing relation between them in those days. They shared each other's ideas, even if they, the results sound very different. So that's the numerical side. Let's go back to the tuition side. What makes Zemlinski tick as a composer? I think that's important to understand. When he had graduated to the main school of the conservatorium in Vienna, his first teacher for several years was Robert Fuchs. Now that's no surprise because almost everybody who studied composition at that time in Vienna went to Robert Fuchs. He taught operetta composers. Sibelius came from Helsinki to study privately with him. He taught Heuberger, Leo Fall, Franz Schreker later, many, many composers of his generation. He taught them basically all the same principles, structural principles of composition, but very few of them swallowed them as intensively and wholeheartedly as Zemlinsky. Now, Fuchs is best known for his serenades for strings, which are charming, light-hearted pieces, but they were not his raison d'etre as a composer. They, they called him Serenaden Fuchs because of his lovely serena serenades. I would prefer to call him Pfennig Fuchs, which is an untranslatable term, but it, you would say, look after the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves. His principle was, you will take an absolute minimum of musical ideas maybe just two or three notes, and a rhythm. And you should work with these very, very small cells of information, extending them, inverting them, turning them backwards, superimposing them into an entire work. Uh, and he did this himself in many particular sonatas and symphonies with a varying degree of, of success. He was as close as anybody in Vienna at the time to Brahms, who, of course, worked according to the same principles, but never, perhaps not quite as rigidly as Fuchs. And um, what we've now come to call the art of, or the technique of variative development <coughs> or developing variation, later proposed by Schoenberg, as, for instance, in the last of his five orchestral pieces as the non plus ultra, it all comes via Zemlinsky from Robert Fuchs. Variative development. For instance, a classic case, the beginning of Zemlinsky's clarinet trio. He has two ideas. Not surprisingly, his favorite. Well, there's this. That's the first idea. You can't be more, shall we say, parsimonious than that. But of course, by amplifying one of the intervals, He's very quickly got it into his ego theme. There's the ego theme again. The second bar of what I played is the other idea, the rhythm. Simply that. A little, little figure that turns on itself and has this. And with that, believe it or not, he manages to create an entire 25 or 30 minute work for 
clarinet trio. And he worked according to these principles all his life. Alma Mahler, who studied with him at the turn of the century, remarked that he could take the tiniest of ideas and mold it like a piece of, 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 of clay in his hands to turn it into any kind of, any form he, he wished to, 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 to take on. He could make it, it laugh, he could make it cry, he could make it strident, he could make it uh, passive. Of all, he, he had a wonderful ability to, to mold the, a poem of a song to these tiny ideas that he would, which he would use to find it. Uh, often enough, they were quite complicated, but they were always very short. The, the, the art of making very, very much of, out of almost nothing. This is, as I say, he had Fuchs to thank for that. And even later, when his style changed, he moved away from the world of Brahms. He remained true to this principle. It's really rigid, constructive principles in, used in the most flexible and unpredictable of manners. The other extraordinary thing about Zeminski is his movement of styles. If you listen to an early piece like the clarinet trio or the first string quartet, you will say, ah, oh, this is an epigone, a, 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 a follower of Brahms, which he certainly was, but he kept his eyes and his ears well clearly open to the music of Wagner as well. He and Schoenberg must have attended numerous performances of all the Wagner operas at the, at the, uh, the, Stadt, the Hof Oper, on the Mahler's Baton or others. There was a huge cycle of all the Mahler operas, I believe, in 1893. And they would certainly have, Schoenberg said later on, he missed none of them. They knew these pieces by heart. So when he, he, Zemlinsky came to compose his own first opera, it was, it was sort of wagner light, you might say. It was a very <laughs> Wagnerian piece, Sarema, the style was Wagnerian, but the piece only lasts about an hour and three quarters, and the orchestration is light and frothy, although it's a very serious piece. Actually, it's rather a tragedy that nobody has cottoned on to Sarema because the action plays in what we now call Chechnya and is based, really, on a band of terrorists. Maybe it would be politically incorrect to stage it because it puts the, the entire scene from the point of view of the terrorists. There's this... Muslim girl called Sarema, who's fallen for a Russian officer. But in the end, it can only lead to disaster. She commits suicide. The re remainder of her, of her clan take over the Russian camp, and at the end of the opera, it goes up, it's, it's blown up. Yeah, but one would have thought that some producer would have been interested enough in this fairly topical material to take it on, but it hasn't been staged in years, and then it was well done, unfortunately, rather less than well, shall we say. However, Sarema won Zeminski a very important prize in Munich. Not first prize, they awarded him a second equal prize. But um, word of this piece came back to Vienna, and Mahler, who was by then uh, chief conductor of the Hof Oper, decided to perform Sarema. Zeminski said, no, please, I'm working on a new opera called uh, Es war einmal, Once Upon a Time in English, based on a Danish play. I would like to write you this one. And, uh, so they, they settled on S. Weinmal. As I said before, it was a huge success, premiere in January 1900, by which time Zeminski was just 29 years old. And it was, the, it was the, the high point of his career. As a result of the success of S. Weinmal, Mahler finally asked him to write another opera. And uh, after much milling around, they settled he and his librettist, Leo Feld. His brother was an operetta librettist. Leo Feld was a, a, a dictator, a, a, a poet, Monke. Leo Feld, they settled on a, a very strange subject about a young village boy who is lured away by a, by a dream princess. This was the age of Freud, we must not forget, and the, the interpretation of dreams. So there's nothing more topical than a dream princess. He falls in love with the dream princess, rushes off to find her, finds only disillusion, squalor, disappointment, returns to his village finally, and recognizes in, in a, a fallen woman with whom he had come into league in the second act, his, the, incorporation, the, the incarnation of his dream princess, the Taumgurger, the Taumgurger. It's interesting that this piece... The title of the, the opera has 13 letters. Everybody warned him not to do it. 
Don't write the, don't call it that, call it the Traumjörg, the Traumgörg, or just leave out the, the, the there at the beginning, but for heaven's sake, not 13 letters. When Schoenberg came to the same problem with Moses and Aaron, which would have made uh, the normal spelling 13 letters, he solved the problem by removing the first A from Aaron. They were, the, they were that suspicious of, of, of the numbers. But anyway, Traumgörg went on into print with with the 13 letters, and it was never performed. I myself was present at the world premiere, which didn't take place until, I think, 1980 uh, in Nuremberg. It wasn't performed. Mahler was obliged to leave the Hof Oper before the rehearsals had finished, and his successor, Felix Weingartner, immediately put the piece to one side, said, maybe we'll perform it, but he never did. And, and there it remained. It languished. Yes, it's, a, it's maybe the solar plexus of Zemlinsky's music, certainly worth hearing, although I've never seen it well staged, but it's, 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 it's incredible music. Now, there's an extraordinary thing here. Gerger becomes another expression of Zemlinsky's ego. And so the main theme of Gerger, he chooses his ego theme again, but he expands it. We have these three notes, the familiar three notes, this time... <laughs> a G and a B and we get this. of two halves which are in contrast to one another. The first half may be the divine, and the second half the human, or the strong and the weak. The, the, the theme built of antithesis. The first half is order, the second half is chaos, whatever the situation. So here we have two very clear intervals and a clear rhythm. <laughs> something totally rhythmically and harmonically not so clear. And this is his material really for the entire opera. Not only that, but when he came to his last opera, Der König Kandaules, which he never completed, Kandaules makes his first entry in Act One to the music of Gerda. It's the same person, but now clad in rich, a regal panoply, and it sounds like this. Another theme that comes again and again is actually first heard, not in a work of Zemlinsky's, but in Schoenberg's Pelias and Melisande, the theme that Schoenberg always associates with Melisande, You'll find it in many of his operas as well. Um, it always, the, the M of Melisande becomes the M of Matilda. It's his sister who is speaking to us through this voice. These are the interesting skeins of, of, of Zemlinsky's structures. Going through the operas, I've mentioned earlier the fourth opera, Kleider machen Leute. It was one of those attempts shortly before the First World War to use the new post-Wagnerian richness, not only for tragedies and, and uh, blood and guts dramas, but also for a comedy. So Zemlinsky wrote Kleider machen Leute, Clothes Make the Man. At the, roughly the same time, Strauss composed the Ro Der Rosenkavalier, and Busoni composed Die Brautfall. All of them amazingly long, and perhaps sometimes long-winded comedies, but all Wonderful scores in their way, but it wasn't quite the zeitgeist for musical comedy. And the musical comedies that, that filled the halls were the operettas of the silver era of, era of, of Leha and Leo Fall and Oskar Strauss and so on. They couldn't compete with their huge orchestras, the three pieces I mentioned, 
Strauss was successful. Strauss was born with gold in his cradle. Strauss was not a Jew. Uh, but apart from that, he was an extremely talented composer. We must not ignore that fact. But um, others were less successful in this genre. So Kleider machen Leute was performed a few times in Vienna in 1910. It was Zemlinsky's wonderful month. A few days earlier, one of his most important works received its first, its first performance. His uh, four songs are of after poems by Maurice Martelink, which he later expanded to six songs, later still orchestrated, become perhaps one of his finest works. And then the same month, Franz Schreker, his friend and former assistant, performed for the first time a wonderful setting of Psalm 23, The Lord is My Shepherd. Nevertheless, Zemlinsky's fate in Vienna had been sealed. All but the, 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 the firmest friends had given him up. He said he has nothing new to say to us. One of his firmest advocates and friends towards the end was the, was the critic Julius Korngold, and he in fact had sent his son Erich Wolfgang to study with Zemlinsky in 1911, but of course when Zemlinsky moved away to Prague, that period of study, which was already fairly short, came abruptly to an end. In Prague, Zemlinsky had a huge amount of conducting to, to negotiate through. He was suddenly chief conductor in, in a, in a theatre which was uh, scheduled to serve a whole community. It was interesting, a completely new situation for him. In Vienna, he had risen from the, the squalor, shall we say, of, of, of the, the second Patsiak to relatively salubrious surroundings in another part of Vienna. In Prague, Prague was basically two cities superimposed upon another at that time. There was the rising element of Czech nationalism, when they spoke Czech, of course, the Slavic language is their native tongue, and there was the slowly falling element of German um, nationalism. In fact, by the time Zemlinsky arrived in Prague, what was permanently called German was in fact Austrian Jewish. There were almost no non Jewish. German speakers in Prague, but it was an amazingly talented clique. There were writers, there were painters, I forgot, not Kafka, for instance. They ran the business life of, of Bohemia and actually the entire surrounding areas and were a force to be reckoned with at that time. So when the Czechs built their own national theater in the 1890s, the Germans whipped round the hat and collected enough to build their own Neues Deutsches New German Theater, which became a center for everything German. It was even used later for, for showing films. They had a fine orchestra, they had a fine sequence of chief conductors. Mahler had been there, Leo Blech had been there, Arthur Bordansky, who was uh, Zemlinsky's uh, closest friend of all. Zemlinsky himself came there in 1911, as I say, and stayed until the late 20s. And there they played everything. It was a huge repertoire. They had a wonderful ring cycle. Stravinsky visited uh, Prague and said it was the finest Mozart conducting he had ever heard, performance of Figaro. Uh, it was a, a, very much a, a closely knit ensemble theatre. And Zemlinsky would conduct something like 150, 200 performances a season. The repertoire was large because the number of season ticket holders was relatively small, so it, towards the end of, the, of his tenure in particular, they played anything up to 50 different operas per season, often with, of course, very little rehearsal, but evidently the orchestra was, was superb. When the entire apparatus was disbanded by the Nazis, those of the orchestra who still survived moved into Germany and became the Bamberg Symphony Orchestra, which, is, which still retains something of that golden sound that apparently <coughs> the, the Czech uh, German opera orchestra produced. Later, uh, successes to Zemlinsky in Prague included George Sell in the 30s and Karl Runkel, who later came to Covent Garden as chief conductor in the early 50s. So it was a, a small, it was a provincial stage, if you like, but it, it was a beautiful little theatre and it was a very important centre for opera in, in, in its way. But nevertheless, it was neither Vienna nor Berlin. It was a railway station on the way between the two. And then Zemlinsky became increasingly aware of and sensitive to that fact that he was actually wearing out his energies in the provinces. 
the, the more he had to conduct, of course, the less time there was to compose. And like most of his conducting colleagues, if they wanted to compose, they were recommended to do so in the summer vacation, which was quite long, uh, nevertheless unpaid in those days, unpaid summer vacation, so we'd sit down and work on an opera score or an oratorio or whatever was, was, was going on. During the season, he just about had time to orchestrate some of that score, but actually the original conception of a piece took that much longer. Under those circumstances, though, never, nevertheless, in Prague, he wrote the, most, the finest music of his, in, of his entire career. The second string quartet followed a few days later by a Florentine tragedy based on the play by Oscar Wilde. Later, after the First World War, Der Zwerg, uh, also based on Oscar Wilde's Birthday of the Infanta, but written to a free libretto. And the climax of this all was the Lyric Symphony, which uh, Zemlinski composed at the beginning of the 20s and was not, not, not performed until 1924. This was the, the highest point of his post-romantic output, shall we say, an outpouring of beauty and, and eloquence and frustration and uh, everything together. It's a, it's a panoply of, of the of what post-romantic music has to offer. Fortunately, he was smart enough to realize when he heard the piece that he couldn't go any further in that direction. As it happened, 1924, Prague was the, the venue for the annual festival of the Society for the Promotion of New Music, the ISC and ISNM. So he conducted, for instance, the world premiere of, of Schoenberg's Erwartung, in 1924, but he also heard pieces by composers he didn't know at all. Mio, for instance, or some of the English composers of the time. Uh, Krenick, who was just an up-and-coming up young genius. Kurt Weil, above all. All these new, new impulses came to him, and he realized that along the lines of Der Zwerg and the Second Quartet and the, the Lyric Symphony, nothing further was going to be possible. And so the result was, shall we say, first of all, silence. Mm, if I can interrupt the uh, narration with a brief joke, which uh, uh, the composer based so much, so contemporary of Sigmund Freud, I think a joke is allowed. There's the story of the two housewives who are talking together over the garden fence. And one says to the other, when I, whenever I'm down in the dumps, I buy myself a new hat. Oh, that's where you get them, says the other. And, um, <laughs> and, and um, I think one could say, without over-exaggerating, that whenever Zemlinsky was down in the dumps, he wrote a new composition. And that's not where he found them, but that's, uh, shall we say, a mental situation. And what really set him onto his third period of composition. The first was the Brahmsian, then there was the, the neo-romantic, the, the post-romantic, and then the neoclassical, modernistic phrase. So his his sister, sister Matilda had died uh, in 1923. Schoenberg, who had, was actually honor-bound by Jewish tradition to mourn her death for 12 months, met the sister of the violinist Rudolf Kolisch, Gertrude Kolisch, fell in love with her. He was incapable of being on his own. He, he would become a chain smoker. He was a total nervous wreck, and he needed somebody to look after him, and Gertrude was the ideal person for that. But nevertheless, the, the period of mourning had by no means elapsed before he fell in love and proposed marriage to Gertrude Kolisch. Zemlinsky was so shocked uh, by this breach of of manners, shall we say, a brief breach of, of, of tradition, that it prompted him to write a new piece, and that was the third string quartet. Third string quartet, which suddenly was a completely new departure. Now, another thing that contributed to this piece was Schoenberg's summoning together of all his pupils and friends in 1923 to demonstrate to them the technique of composition with, with 12 words. <coughs> As I say, a technique of which Zemlinsky did not approve. The combination of these things with Schoenberg suddenly became vilified in his eyes, led to a new style, which was actually not a style from within. It was a parody of what he had heard outside. So, for instance, he has a theme 
on a, a set of variations on a theme which is almost no theme at all. It just it starts like this. <laughs> Clearly, it's just taken. Maybe that's a distortion of his own. Uh, but then he's put one one of the notes up on octave because that's what one does in twelve-note music, and you get this the uh, the, uh, the the theme of the, the pseudo theme of a set of wonderful variations. Then there's a a wonderful romance, which is a kind of portrait of his sister. There's a burlesque which is a portrait of himself, and the first movement which seems to concentrate on the contrast between a male principle and a female principle. Anyway, uh, the, so the third quartet, and then, as I say, this was based not on a genuine new, new evaluation of the musical world, but on a parody of it, a, a hall of distorting mirrors, if you like, that he would take his previous music and distort it in various ways and other people's music, and it actually amounted to a remarkably fine and convincing piece of, of, of new music, because, of course, he kept his own principles of motivic uh, economy and, and structural re relations and so on, despite everything. Nevertheless, that work was followed by years of silence, he attempted to comp compose a new opera uh, based, like Kleider Machenleuten, on a novel, by, a short story by um, Gottfried Keller that was uh, abandoned after a short time. His dear friend Mari Pappenheim, who had written the libretto of Schoenberg's Erwartung, wrote a libretto for him based on a play by Kotzebue that didn't get beyond a few pages of sketch. Then he started on a new string quartet, this time in six movements, but he only completed two and a half. The rest remained simply sketches. And nothing really gelled and succeeded until he found himself down in the dumps again, this time because his first wife, Ida, Ida died in a Berlin hospital after a long illness. And that prompted him, he found in a... Murray Pappenheim had sent him a collection of poems written by black Americans, mostly Langston Hughes, County Cullen, and so on, with the title Afrika Singt, translated into, into German. And she thought he would, it would interest him. And he found one called Schwarzbraunes Mädel, a black brown girl, which seemed to depict his own wife lying on, on her bier or lying on her hospital bed, we don't know. But he set that to music, and it got, got him going. Within a few weeks, he'd composed seven such songs and, and strung them together to make a series of symphonic, symphonische Gesänge, symphonic songs. It was really the beginning of his, of his last period. Wonderful pieces, fairly dry. Some of it sounds remarkably like Janacek, Zemlinski had, meanwhile, in Prague, become an ardent uh, advocate of Czech music, in particular of Janáček, so there are some relationships there, but most of it is entirely his own world. It's tonal, and yet he pushes tonality to the absolute frontiers without ever, ever going over them. That's, I think, the most important thing. He never, ever wrote atonally. Uh, he gets very, very, very close to it on occasion, but there's always a return a particularly D minor became a very, very cherished key towards the end of his life. He always managed just to find a way back to a tonal framework. This was followed by a big opera, his seventh opera, The Chalk Circle, Der Kreidekreis, based not on Brecht, whose Caucasian, Caucasian circle had not yet been written, but uh, by a man called Klarbund, fairly forgotten nowadays, but in his day very successful, uh, was married to Carol Onea, the sister of the stage designer Kaspar Neher. So it was all one crowd together, the left-wing intelligentsia of the early 1930s. Zemlinski fitted perfectly into that scheme. He not only composed... The Kreidekreis was a completely new break with him. Instead of writing huge uh, paragraphs of, of, uh, of closely knit music, he wrote a number opera in, 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 interspersed with spoken dialogue. As in the case of Brecht, it was a kind of attempt, his attempt at epic theatre. And it has one very touching, salient feature at the end, which is the heroine of this piece, the Kreidekreis, goes through all kinds of privations and, and, and 
on problems until it, uh, she seems to be, have been sentenced, sentenced to death and is taken off to Peking to be judged by the, the new emperor of China. And um, it transpires uh, that this emperor was a young soldier who had taken her in her sleep when she was working in a, shall we say, a, a house of ill repute outside of the... the, the and and her, her child, who is the object of contention between her and another wife, who claims that this is her child, her child, it, it transpires, the father of that child is the emperor himself. And so, on being condemned to death, she's suddenly raised up to sit on the highest golden throne. And the music begins to soar and whoop in D major, D major with an added G sharp. In his fate, that means his key of fate was D minor with an added G sharp. You'll find it everywhere in the string quartets too. And suddenly towards the end of his life we begin to get the same thing in the major. But it's an illusion. We become aware. It's rather like the, the closing scene of Fidelio, which Harry Kupfer, for instance, interpreted perhaps justifiably as an impossible utopian solution to, to that opera. That uh, the end, we know that a, a, a humble peasant girl sentenced to death is scarcely likely to become the, the empress of China. So it's 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 a it's a magic magic lantern effect, and the music accompanies it. The same thing happens a few years later in a wonderful setting of Psalm 13. Uh, Lord, how long shall I suffer? It begins, and it gradually mounts up to a, a general call for restitution, and becomes at the end again one of these <coughs> insanely over optimistic D major fanfaring utopian dreams. Uh, well, you, the year of composition, 1937, tells you a very different story. In fact, the, the background to this Psalm 13 is very interesting because Zemlinski had been called back to Prague to take over from uh, Václav Talich, who was sick, to conduct a, a performance of a, an orchestrated version of the Art of Fugue. It's a piece he didn't know, and an arrangement he didn't know, but he learned it on the train to Prague, as well I can see, and it was a very successful concert. And afterwards, the Czech, pub, Czech press, which has become, had become, meanwhile, violently anti-German, wrote reviews to the tenor of, why do we have to bring in a German conductor when we have plenty of Czech conductors of our own? There was nothing, nothing positive to be said about this performance at all, but Zemlinski took it home, and... From the, the, the main theme of the Art of Fugue, he developed his own theme, which was also incredibly contrapuntally um, elaborated, which became the beginning, the opening section of Psalm 13. It was one of the last pieces he wrote before leaving Austria. The other was the fourth string quartet. He was working all the way through from 1935 onwards on his eighth opera, Der König Kandales. Shortly before the Nazis marched into Austria, he had just about completed the short score, but he, he had to interrupt it. Uh, as I may remind you, in the, uh, the, the Christmas 1935 was the death of uh, the sudden unexpected death of Alban Berg, and and he was, with the absence of Schoenberg, who was already long since in in America, and a sort of breakdown of relations with Webern, Berg had become Zemlinski's strongest <coughs> ally, a very dear friend. Zemlinski was not a person to draw himself forward. There was certainly, he was certainly with all the other mourners in the, the cemetery at Grinzing when Berg was buried, um, early, I think, uh, in, the, in the last days of 1935. Well, his reaction was to interrupt his work on the opera score and compose a string quartet in memory of his dead friend. And uh, Berg himself had dedicated his lyric suite to Zemlinski, so as a, an act of homage, uh, he himself chose, again, a six-movement form, three pairs of movements as the lyric suite, and, in fact, subtitled the work Suite. For some reason or other, that subtitle never made its way into the printed score, so people don't, aren't quite aware of the, the close connection. And musically, the two works have virtually nothing in common. But uh, the, the fourth quartet was, I think, the last work that Zemlinski completed before leaving, leaving Austria, once he'd packed his bags, he was sitting on crates and waiting to transfer everything to, uh, to his new home, he started work on the clarinet quartet, 
abandoned it and took it up again in New York. He arrived in New York with his wife just after Christmas in 1938. And he'd been invited by his old friend and pupil, Bodansky, who had been since, since 1915 chief conductor of German repertoire at the Met. Bodansky had visited Europe almost every summer, never broke, broken his connections with Zemlinsky. He was well aware of the work in progress, Dr. Koenig Kandalis, and he said, OK, come to America, we will stage it at the Met. And Zemlinsky came full of hope. He still had to orchestrate two-thirds of the opera, but it was otherwise finished. And he sat down with Bodansky and a critic from the New York Times, and they started talking about it. And Zemlinsky showed them the libretto. Unfortunately, the major aspect, the central aspect of this opera is nudity. In the, in the second act, the soprano is, supposedly to take, is supposed to take off everything and reveal herself naked to the baritone, the tenor being the soprano's husband, the king, Candalus. It's just, uh, what Sheed, who was the, the uh, author of this, this play, called the action gratuite, the gratuitous action, was of, of revealing the beauty of your wife to a stranger, in this case a humble fisherman, so we say tempting fate, and of course fate doesn't let itself be tempted. At the end of the opera, the fisherman stabs the king to death and takes, takes over the throne himself. This time not with a wonderful utopian uh, fanfare, but with a black A minor fatal blast. <laughs> Nevertheless, the problem of nudity in an American opera house was, shall we say, extreme. Bordanzi, as they had arrived in America in 1915, and he'd been known in Europe for his wonderful conducting of Strauss, so of course he was very anxious to perform Der Rosenkavalier at the Met. He made it, I think, as far as the dress rehearsal in 19, 1918 or thereabouts. I may, may be wrong about this. And then the, the ladies from the government, shall we say the benefactors of the Met, came to the dress rehearsal and saw the soprano and the mezzo-soprano lying half naked on a bed and said, this will never do, and it was cancelled. Uh, he didn't actually get to conduct Der Rosenkavalier at the Met until 1933, by which time it had been played all over the States, but not at the Met, including the, the other big opera house in New York where Mary Garden, the celebrated soprano Mary Garden, made a big success of the, the role of the marshalling, but Bodansky was prob knew well of this problem. It was only five years, six years ago that he conducted Rosenkavalier for the first time, and he was a composer who was totally unknown, asking that the soprano should be seen completely naked. He said, there's no way this can be done, and so Zemlinsky obediently started writing a ninth opera. He'd scarcely started when he suffered a severe stroke uh, and actually never wrote a note again. Um, so the end of his days was rather sad. His, his brother-in-law came from Europe with the entire family fortune with the intention of that they should all move to California, build a be beautiful house and somehow survive there. But the brother himself, although he was only 32 years old, was suffering from a, a, a very rare and, and severe uh, liver disease and he only survived a few months himself. They built a beautiful house, but not in California, but in, in the uh, upper New York State. Zemlinski moved in there, by the time he was in a wheelchair, and four days later he died. Uh, America was just mobilizing for war. There was no chance of his death even being reported in European papers. He died in complete obscurity. Now, this obscurity has continued well into our time. I'm almost a little bit distressed, having spent so much time uh, researching and promoting and editing and adoring Zemlinsky's music. I'm always distressed uh, to find people, educated, musical people, who say, I've never heard the name. Not long ago, I had a conversation with no less than Pierre Boulez on this topic. And uh, he said, Zemlinsky, he said to me, is that the man who wrote the Lyric Symphony? Uh, he didn't know anything about Zemlinsky. And other people who are obviously less informed than him know less still. And the way publicity works nowadays, in you, okay, in the old days, one used to go to a record shop and the, composer, the classic music was laid out alphabetically by composer usually with a special extra section for the tenors and sopranos from A to Z. Uh, in your average record shop, 
you would, re- you would get to W and they'd have some Wagner. With a bit of luck, they'd have some Weil. Maybe, if it was a really good record shop, they'd have some Zelenka. But they never really got as far as Zemlinski, very rarely, very rarely. And nowadays, if you listen to your music on Spotify or Last FM or whatever, or Google or whoever, I want to, no advertising here. Um, um, if, you, if you do that, you again, you get an alphabetical list starting at the top and going to the bottom. And it takes a lot of courage to work you through unless you press the arrow that turns it all upside down, work your way through to the bottom and give, give the old Zeds a try. But there's wonderful music to be found there. And I hope, as I say, I hope I haven't been preaching this evening to the converted. I'm sure there's some scope for increasing one's knowledge. Virtually everything Zemlinski composed is nowadays available on, on CD and recorded form. There's very few opera videos of that kind of thing. There's one of Det Zwerg from uh, Los Angeles, which is very fine. Um, But uh, as I say, all the music is there. It's just looking for people, enthusiasts, to go out and pluck it and enjoy it, because it really is, it's music that could give endless pleasure. um, And without wanting to indulge in any further advertising fantasies, I thank you for listening to me so attentively and say good evening. (laughs)